right, did you have a good day today? Yes. Who found the most bones? Not me. I found two trash bones in the southeast. Did you? I worked two days on them. I loaded several wheelbarrows worth of dirt, didn't I? Yeah. Along with your help. So uh, we all got some action in today. By the way, I found out uh, James, who we had prayer for yesterday, I found out he is uh, in the hospital with a constricted bowel, and they had to take out a section of his intestine to save his life, actually. So he, he almost died. He can die very quickly from having a constricted bowel. And... So uh, he's at least in, in safe harbor at the moment. But it puts him out of uh, commission for a long time. So keep him in your prayers. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of calling upon you. We ask your blessing upon James. We're glad that this problem has been resolved. We pray that you will give him speedy healing. Thank you today for safety in the quarries, for the blessings that you gave us, for the group of students we had here from the uh, school in Dallas. We ask now that you will continue with us into this class. Give us an understanding of things that are hard to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. We're about ready to launch into the section on uh, taxonomy and systematics. So we'll have an introduction to that tonight and also talk about the Mesozoic, which is where the dinosaurs are. So we're not looking at the whole fossil record, but we'll take a, a brief survey of what some scientists think was happening during the Mesozoic and why uh, what their explanations are for why the things we see are there. So we'll kind of look at what they say about Mesozoic climates, uh, the kinds of plants that were around both in the marine environment and on land. We'll look at the invertebrates that we find in the Mesozoic, and then we'll look at the various vertebrates and talk a little bit about the end of the Cretaceous. In all of this, I'm going to present the views of secular uh, geologists and paleontologists, and then we will discuss the bases for their conclusions. So let's tar talk about uh, the climates in secular uh, considerations that include millions of years. It's uh, going to give us explanations that are very different than what we might think are correct for the time when this deposit took place. Because we think that probably all of these deposits took place during the rainy season. Right? But uh, if you're a secular paleontologist and you think this took place over um, 100 million years or more, then you're going to have to talk about what kinds of climates prevailed. And to do that, you look at various kinds of evidence. One of the evidences that's used very often is things we call evaporites. Evaporites are deposits that today are occurring in hot, arid regions of the world. So where we find evaporites, evaporites are things like salt deposits, gypsum, and other things like that that, that seem to be indi indicative of, a, of an evaporative environment. And today you're only going to get that if you have a lot of uh, wind and a lot of uh, evaporation going on. So that's how they score a lot of this information and that's how they derive a lot of their climatic conclusions is from the position of evaporites. But you can see here in the diagram on the right-hand side for early Cretaceous that there are evaporites at every latitude. And even though these latitudes are reconstructed with plate tectonics in mind, they still seem to indicate that evaporation was going on everywhere if these are truly evaporites. And uh, that's something we can question. We can discuss that 
in the discussion section about what evaporites are and how they could arise. But in traditional thinking, these are salt deposits and other kinds of, uh, not just sodium chloride, but other kinds of salts that were precipitated out of seawater. Here is a, an attempt to reconstruct the history of the climates of the Earth. And one thing you can notice very quickly is that here at the top, where you're talking about the whole Phanerozoic, uh, you can see that the Mesozoic right in here is the hottest time, and the Triassic and Jurassic are the hottest of the hot. And so we have basically in the beginning parts of the Mesozoic, we have very warm climates. And then after the end of the Mesozoic, we have a cooling off of the Earth until we have the um, quaternary period where you had ice sheets and so on. And here the number of degrees is, is uh, depends on who you're talking about, but here the global atmospheric temperature is 15 degrees centigrade, which is uh, the average. This again is a diagram based on the evolutionary hypothesis. That's why you see the word first there. And it's not exactly accurate. For example, the first actual dinosaurs are up here and the earliest mammals are in the same place. Dinosaurs and mammals show up in the fossil record at about the same time. The breakup of Pangaea is normally uh, inscribed in Middle Triassic. And that means that this big mega con continent of Pangaea is starting to come apart. And we're going to see the spreading of those continents throughout the Mesozoic. Uh, first birds are oftentimes placed in the upper Jurassic and sometimes occasionally down here in the Triassic. But interestingly, they are all before, all the beginnings of birds are before the dinosaurs which are believed by some people to have given rise to the birds. And that's a conundrum that uh, we will address later on. The first placental mammals, that would be non-marsupials, uh, non are, are scored here at the contact between the Jurassic and Cretaceous. First flowering plants up here in the middle of Cretaceous. And then the loss of dinosaurs, ammonites, and many other fossils at the end of the Cretaceous. So a lot's going on in this uh, section of the fossil record. Let's talk a little bit about the relationship of plants and foods. If uh, you have a world without plants, you're not going to have any food to eat because we derive all of our energy from starches, oils, sugars, uh, of plants and also the byproduct of photosynthesis, which is oxygen. So we breathe in oxygen, we take in the storage products of the plants, and then we breathe out carbon dioxide and uh, waste products that supply the food for the plants. So it's a beautifully designed system. It's hard to imagine uh, how that could have just happened that way but without having it that way, you wouldn't have life for very long. So we have plants producing stuff, and then animals eating that stuff, and then animals giving rise to the products that plants need. So it's a, it's a really unique structure. This is the ecological uh, pyramid over here, detailing the relationship of various kinds of animals. Notice it's hierarchical, so the producers are down here at the bottom. Uh, primary producers here, herbivores here, uh, planktonivores here, and piscivores here. Those are animals that eat plankton and fish and plants. So the cycle of nature is that sun is giving us the energy that's running this whole system. The sun energy is turned into carbohydrate by the plants. That material is then eaten by the animals, and that drives the animals so that they can do the work that needs to be done. And then the animals provide the carbon dioxide that the plants need, 
and the food products for plants. This is a diagram that shows the relationship of carbon dioxide and temperature. And the interesting thing about the diagram is that the temperature, uh, uh, some, some people today have told us that the carbon dioxide drives temperature. But when you study the curve uh, very carefully, you can see that temperature precedes carbon dioxide. So what's happening is uh, carbon dioxide is stored in the ocean and it's released by an increase in temperature. The water holds less carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide comes out into the air. So you get an increase in carbon dioxide when you increase the temperature. Yes? So, even though people said that global warming is caused by carbon dioxide, it's actually the reverse? Well, if you look at the diagrams, I don't believe the time scale, but if you look at the diagrams of the relationship between global temperatures and global carbon dioxide, the global temperatures always precede the rise of the carbon dioxide or, or loss of carbon dioxide. So uh, that you can read that any way you want. It's clear that if you increase the temperature of the oceans, you get more carbon dioxide out. So it's easy to understand why that is. We're not going to get into a discussion of global warming in this class because that's not our, our concern, but these are the these are the facts of the data. This is what the data reveal. And one of the causes that has been proposed for elevating the carbon dioxide was a, a huge uh, meteoric impact at the end of the Cretaceous. And the other is the Deccan Traps. Deccan Traps are the huge volcanic deposits down in India. And the Deccan Traps produced uh, a lot of carbon dioxide and that could have caused uh, the end of the Cretaceous. Some people believe that caused the end of the Cretaceous, and that explains the loss of forms at the end of the Cretaceous we'll talk about in a minute. What kinds of plants did we have in the Cretaceous? Well, at first, we had the same plants that we had in the Jurassic and the Triassic and in the Paleozoic. So we have coniferous plants. They're present in the Paleozoic. They're present in the Triassic and Jurassic. And they're also present in the Cretaceous. We have ferns. Ferns are present in the Paleozoic. They're present in the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. And we have a group of plants called cycads and allies. Cycads and benetetales. These are plants that are best known for the cycad that you see in the malls all the time called zamia. It looks like kind of a palm tree. It has a central big cone. It is a gymnosperm, but it is very different from, from the coniferous gymnosperms. And these plants are abundant in the, in the Mesozoic. So the Mesozoic, we have coniferous trees. We have um, the uh, cycads and we have ferns. Those would be the main plants that you'd be familiar with. But in the ocean, there's a very different story. We see this abundance of plants preserved as fossils in the Mesozoic. These would be things like, uh, what you see here is a diatom down at the bottom, uh, rotiferin here, and some uh, cara algae up here. So marine plants, we see cyanobacteria, Green algae, acrotarchs. Acrotarchs are uh, the resting spores of, of a organism. And in the Mesozoic, we get dinoflagellates, coccolithophorids, silicoflagellates, and diatoms. So pre-Mesozoic, we don't see dinoflagellates, coccolithophorids, silicoflagellates, or diatoms as a rule. This is very important because each one of these groups of plants is a major uh, tack, is a major uh, useful identifier of sediments that are Mesozoic. So we can tell where we are in the Mesozoic by looking at the dinoflagellates we find. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what does cyanobacteria like? What does cyano stand for? Blue. Blue. Uh huh. Okay. Blue green algae. 
So let's take a look at these then because these are very important diagnostics for the stratigraphy of the Mesozoic. Uh, these are single-celled organisms. They are unicellular. They have a pollen grain-like cell wall, the same thing that pollen grains are made of. Uh, they have flagella and they are present in two different lifestyles, both a planktonic motile form and a cyst form. The cyst is very interesting. It has all these plate structures on it, uh, again, of, of uh, sporopollenin. And the life uh, form has flagella that stick out and it moves its way around the oceans. These are found in the deposits here on the ranch. We have found um, dinoflagellates and acrotarchs and uh, cysts. Yes? Couldn't we just found it in random soil samples? What's that? So we just found those in random soil samples? Random uh, samples of the cuttings from the walls of the quarry. Another very prominent thing that you see in the Mesozoic is chalk. Chalk is made from these beautiful little creatures called coccolithophorids. And these coccolithophores are made up of little disks. And those disks are made up of calcium carbonate. So when your teacher uses chalk to write on the board, he's writing on the board with microfossils. And we have huge chalk deposits in, in Texas, in the Austin chalk. And at one time, we were going to build the super collider in the Austin chalk. It was going to be buried in the Austin chalk. And they started digging the tunnel for that. And uh, what they did is they got $5 billion from Congress. And they built up all their infrastructure and spent the $5 billion before they ever got started on the tunnel. So they ran out of money. And now the tunnel that they did build, they, they had this big machine. They cut this big, giant tunnel. They had to, it was, I don't know, 50 miles or 100 miles uh, around. And uh, so they started digging that tunnel. Then they ran out of money. And now it's being used to grow mushrooms. So it's probably the world's most expensive mushroom seller. Why do they grow mushrooms there? Because you need a dark, damp place for mushrooms. Is chalk pretty dry? Uh, chalk is dry, yeah. Another kind of microfossil we find, another single cell organism are the chrysophytes. Chrysophytes produce a silica outer test or outer shell. And they are very diagnostic. Uh, they are often associated with vol volcanic ash because the volcanic ash saturates the ocean with silica. And it causes these things to proliferate. And so they grow very rapidly. And we can use these fossils and their characteristic shapes to identify different strata. As I said, we also have uh, trees of various types. And finally, up in the middle of the Cretaceous, between Lower Cretaceous and Upper Cretaceous, we have the advent of the angiosperms. Now, what does that mean? It means below that, we don't find very much evidence that there are any flowering plants on the Earth. Now, if you look out the window, you will see nothing but flowering plants today. In just about any environment you want to look, almost all the plants you see are flowering plants. None of those plants are well represented below the middle of the Cretaceous. And that's one of the great challenges for creationists is to explain where they were all hiding if they were all here. Can you imagine a Garden of Eden without flowers? Can you imagine an earth that wasn't covered with flowers? And yet we find no evidence of flowers, either, either physical evidence or even the pollen grains uh, dispersed in, in deposits that are below uh, the Cretaceous. Now, having said that, middle Cretaceous, having said that, I will uh, then bring up that occasionally people do find them. There were some recently some um, silica spicules that are found in grasses were located in the Pennsylvanian way back in the Paleozoic. And there aren't supposed to be any grasses around until 
Oligocene, which is mid Cretaceous, mid uh, Cenozoic. So, how do you get these silicate grass spicules in, in deposits that are way back in the Pennsylvania? Uh, and, and there, of course, is the studies in India where uh, for many years Indian scientists were reporting the presence of flowering plant pollen and other things and insects in their deposits from the Precambrian. Salt deposits. Well, salt deposits are mobile, and so the geologists all came along and they said, well, it can't be, or the, the paleobotanists all said it can't be Cambrian because it's, I mean, it can't be a Precambrian deposit because it's got plants in it, modern plants. And the Geologists uh, went out and looked at it. They had a big conference. They brought all these geologists from all over the world to look at it. And the geologists said, yes, without question, it's Cambrian. There's no other way to explain it. And the paleobotanists were so shamed by their colleagues telling them that it couldn't be that they eventually dropped it and they made it forbidden to work on the, on the problem anymore. So nobody even looks at it now. But that, that went on for quite a number of years back in the 1940s, 1950s. Uh, there were all these exchanges between geologists and, and paleobotanists. And uh, finally, the Indian paleobotanists just shut the whole thing down. So they don't talk about it anymore. Nobody solved the problem. But it's not brought up because it goes against the vast majority of the data that say there are no flowering plants below Middle Cretaceous. Uh, in my own research, we went back to a deposit in California, the Great Basin, the, the uh, not the Great Basin, the uh, uh, middle, the, the Cretaceous, Jurassic Cretaceous sediments in uh, California and Oregon, Northern Oregon, Southern Oregon. And we did a series of tests across the boundary between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous clear on up to the upper Cretaceous. That was based, the, the stratigraphy was based on, on uh, dinoflagellates and mollusks. So it had nothing to do with plants. So we took the plant fossils out of the rocks, dissolved the rocks, and took out all the pollen grains and looked at them. And just as was predicted, we came up to middle Cretaceous. We didn't find any angiosperm pollen below it. Suddenly, at Middle Cretaceous, we started finding angiosperm pollen. So this is a huge problem, one that uh, we need to have some answers for. We'd like to have some answers for, uh, but I want you to be aware it's there. It's also a problem for evolutionists because once you have the flowering plants, they're all there. Within the Upper Cretaceous, we find most of the families of plants represented. And one of my colleagues from uh, Brigham Young University reported at a national meeting that he had found in the Jurassic, he had found a maple twig with maple leaves and maple flowers and maple samara. You know the little two-pronged seeds that the maple produces? Uh, the samaras were there, the flowers were there, the leaves were there, and the wood was there. So you got four different checks to see that this is maple, and they all said it was maple, and it's down in the Jurassic. So there are some places where things seem to be in the wrong place. Even if they move that up to the Cretaceous, which they did later on, they just said, oh, th those aren't Jurassic sediments, those are Cretaceous. So they moved it up to the Cretaceous, uh, but you've got maple that's fully modern there, along with all the other angiosperms. So it is, it is a problem for evolutionists as well. In fact, Darwin referred to it as the abominable mystery of the origin of the angiosperms. Okay, so here's your cycads. Here's some cycads. These are conifers back here. And then you have this change that takes place in the upper Cretaceous. Here's some cycads up close. This is the cone. Have you seen these in the malls? They use them in the malls because they're, they're xeric plants. They do well without a lot of care. 
Uh, they do well with low light conditions. They usually grow on the floors of the forest and tropical regions. So uh, they're easy to take care of. So, and they're nice looking, and that's why they use them so much. This is a discussion about co-adaptation between insects, birds, reptiles, and mammals. A lot of these organisms all work together with plants, so they're dependent on certain plants or certain other animals. And so they have to all be there at once in order to have a viable ecosystem. And that's something that, that uh, we want to ask ourselves, do we really see this in the fossil record? For example, you look in the Mesozoic at the dinosaurs in Utah, for example. Here you have thousands of fossils of dinosaurs, but almost no evidence of any plants. And you can see why that would be a problem for explaining them as having lived there where they're found buried. Because those animals probably had to eat literally tons of plants per animal per day in order to survive. And yet there is uh, precious little evidence of plants associated with the dinosaurs. This is a discussion of the fact that the angiosperms uh, appear suddenly in the fossil record, so they have to find where's the first angiosperm. And so they're looking for something that might look primitive and also be in the fossil record uh, early on. And they have found a few things in the Jurassic that look like they were trying to be angiosperms, but pretty much it's still an open question where the angiosperms came from. All right, let's take a look at the marine invertebrates. Now, marine invertebrates are a bit problematic because we have most of them there from the Cambrian, from the get-go. And this list is a list of things that you're very familiar with both if you're a modern biologist and also if you're a Paleozoic biologist, a Paleozoic uh, paleontologist. Bivalves, somebody found a bivalve today in, in North Quay or yesterday, right? Yes. Okay, bivalves uh, were present in the Cambrian, they're also present here in the Cretaceous, and they're present today. Those are clams. Corals, we have corals, uh, we don't have any in our deposit, but we have uh, corals in the Mesozoic, a lot of them. Uh, cephalopods, these are the ammonites. The ammonites are like uh, nautilus, the chambered nautilus, but we don't have any ammonites today. Even though they look just like a chambered nautilus, at least superficially, they're in the same group of cephalopods, they don't exist today. Bellamnites are internal shells of another kind of animal uh, that's also a cephalopod. These are abundant in the Cretaceous, and they're really highly zoned, according to the stratigraphers. You can tell where you are in the Cretaceous by the presence of an ammonite. So if we find an ammonite in our deposit, which is not very likely because it's supposed to be a terrestrial deposit, but it's possible if we found an ammonite in our deposit, we could take it to a paleontologist and he would say, oh, that's from the upper Mistrictian or lower Mistrictian or, or Cenomanian or Santonian or something else. So he'd say exactly where you are in, in what zone in the Mesozoic. Uh, so you can tell where you are in the fossil record by the presence of these animals. Somebody has to explain that to me, how you can do that in a flood uh, scenario, how you can have these ammonites zoned out so carefully in the Mesozoic and yet have this be explained by a catastrophic single year process. It can be done, but you're gonna to have to do some thinking and it's not automatic. Uh, we have gastropods. Gastropods are, are snails. And we have lots of snails here in this deposit. Any of you have found a snail yet? Uh, they're there. Crustaceans are things like crayfish and crabs and things like that. Uh, we don't see those here, of course, because this is not a marine deposit. Protozoans, these are the things that accumulate these thicknesses, but they're also dispersed in the sediments. I suspect, well, we, I told you we found some, some uh, chitinozoans, we found some uh, dinoflagellates here in this deposit, 
Dinoflagellates typically live in the ocean. There are a few freshwater deposits that have uh, some dinoflagellates, but most of the dinoflagellates we find are in, the, are in saltwater deposits. So the fact that we found dinoflagellates is a suggestion that maybe this is not a freshwater stream, that maybe this is an oceanic deposit. Here's just some pictures of different kinds of corals. Uh, at the contact between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic, all the corals changed. Uh, all of the corals of the Paleozoic were rugose-type corals and tabulate corals. All the corals of the Cenozoic and the Mesozoic are these Squaractinian corals. They're very similar, but they're different in profound ways. So something... Uh, really important happened between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. We also find lots of echinoderms. We don't find any here again. Uh, but, uh, oh, by the way, there are lots of ammonites down the road here. If you go down the road, just before you hit the highway on the left-hand side, there's fields there that are down in the deposit that underlies the lance formation. You've gone all the way through the lance and into the next deposit down. And uh, those ammonites, nautiloids, those are Cretaceous also. They're middle Cretaceous or lower upper Cretaceous, and they are, um, they are marine deposits. And here are the ammonites. Ammonites are identified by the type of suture they have. Uh, these are goniotites. These are serotites. And these are ammonites. Ammonitic sutures are the most complex. Uh, goniatitic sutures are less complex. Uh, serotites are somewhere in the middle. And that's why they can identify so many different animals, because they have different suturing patterns, among other things. Yes? Do we still have these animals today? Yes. They live out in the ocean, mostly in the Pacific Ocean. I think all, all of them are in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, they live in the water column, and they are diurnal, so they go up and down every day from, from down near the bottom to up near the top. Okay. That's the only example we have of, of this group. It's not an ammonite, it's a nautiloid, yes. So what kind of suture pattern do modern nautilus have? It doesn't have, it just has straight sutures. Okay. There isn't any fluting at all, and so they just, they just go straight across. The animal really lives only in the front chamber of this thing. The rest of it is hollow, and it has a, um, a part of its body that goes all the way back to the first cell. And it can change the air pressure in there and go up and down in the water column by uh, varying the conditions inside those chambers. Uh, then we have snails, clams. Ostracods. Ostracods are little things that look like clams. Uh, they are, oh, well, they can range anywhere from an inch down to a few millimeters. Uh, but if you open them up inside, you find a little animal that looks like a shrimp. They are their own, their own group, ostracods. They are very diagnostic in the fossil record. Uh, they go all the way from the Paleozoic up to recent. And of course, arthropods. Arthropods are things like insects and uh, also the crabs and crustaceans and so on. All right, we also find vertebrates. Vertebrates are the ones that are going to be more interesting to us because they're more like us. These include amphibians. Amphibians are vertebrates that live in water, they have to be near water for their life cycle. Uh, most of them do, or some of them have worked, to wor worked their way around that problem. But most of them have to live near water because part of their life cycle occurs in water. And they actually change form after they hatch out of the egg uh, into adult form. Reptiles are what we're working with here mostly. Uh, they are largely terrestrial, although not entirely. There are some uh, reptiles that live in the air, and there are a few, even today, that are in the marine environment. I can imagine that a Cretaceous seaway would be a pretty fearsome place to go swimming. 
I just read yesterday that some lady was swimming somewhere in the, I think in the Bahamas or somewhere, and, and a shark came along and deprived her of one of her arms, one of her limbs. But can you imagine a mosasaur or a, a mosasaur with a, with a bite like that, what he could do to you if he caught you in his jaws? <laughs> or plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, mesosaurs, and all these other kinds of marine reptiles. Birds are around in the Mesozoic. Some say from the Triassic, and more commonly people acknowledge their presence from the Upper Jurassic, and mammals. Mammals are here from the middle of Triassic all the way up. So mammals and dinosaurs come on the scene at about the same time. There also are groups that we don't have today. Uh, Temnospondyls are an example. And look at what happens to their family tree. 17 families in the Triassic. Only two families are represented in the Jurassic and one family in the Cretaceous. Now one could say that's evolution, uh, but that's not a good way for evolution to go, is it? Because what's going to happen after the Cretaceous? How many families in the Cenozoic? Zero, that's right. They're going to go extinct. So the Temnospondyls uh, go extinct. The Lysamphibia, these include the frogs, toads, salamanders, and Sicilians. What's a Sicilian? Like a bird form with a skeleton. What is it? It's a, it's a critter. It's, it looks a bit like a bird form with a skeleton, internal skeleton. Right. It's a, it's a vertebrate, but it looks a lot like an earthworm. Interesting characters. All right. These are the things that distinguish the various groups of organisms that gave rise to, supposedly in the evolutionary thinking, to uh, the modern groups that are around and some groups that didn't make it to modern. So we have anapsids. Anapsids are organisms that don't have any holes in their skull aside from their orbits and nares. And the only group we have that is anapsid are the turtles. Uriapsids have a single opening high in the skull, and they include the marine reptiles that are extinct. So they're not of importance uh, to us today. Then there are the diapsids. Diapsids have two holes in their skull, one lower and one back, uh, higher up on the back. And diapsids include dinosaurs, Birds, lizards, and snakes. And what about synapsids? Have a single hole higher up on the back. That includes your relative here. It must be you, right? Are you a synapsid? How many holes can you find in your skull? That depends on if you believe your parents or not. If somebody ever said, do you have holes in your head? The answer is what? Yes. Six. Six holes right. No. One. Okay. Here we are with the dinosaurs. This is our first introduction to systematics. Mesozoic fauna. This is the so-called family tree relating all the groups of dinosaurs together. Notice it has two major branches. One branch are the Ornithischia. The other branch are the Saurischia. Saurus means what? Lizard. Ischia means what? Hip. And Ornitho means bird-like. And this means hip. So there are two major designs of the hips of dinosaurs. And all these dinosaurs can be th thrown into one group or the other. Uh, the Sariscan pelvis looks like this. Various combinations of things. But notice that especially that the pubis points to the front. The ischium points to the back. In the Ornithischian 
pelvis, more like birds, the ischium and the pubis both point to the back. So you have a forward pointing pelvis in the sorioschian and a backward pointing pelvis in the ornithischian hip. So that major distinction divides this group from this group. Notice just incidentally at this point that within the sorioschia there are two major groups. The sauropodomorphs and the theropods. Theropods have what in it? T-Rex. So you've already learned some systematics. And the ornithischia have Hadrosaurs, that's right. Here is another uh, way of en enhancing that, just showing a little more detail. We won't pay attention to this today. It's just a matter of dec deciding where, how deep we want to go into this today. Here's an example of one, one taxon. This is Apatosaurus. Can you all say Apatosaurus? Now that you said it, you have to change it. It's called what today? Brontosaurus. That's right. It used to be called a brontosaurus. And every kid knew what a brontosaurus was. Then a scientist came along and said, you can't use that name for, for a brontosaurus. You have to change it. So they changed it to a patosaurus. And then a, a year ago, they changed it back because they said, oh, it's really OK. Yes? Yeah, there is an apatosaurus, but it's not the brontosaurus. Is there yeah. I thought the brontosaurus was made by putting like a one animal's body on with another animal's skull. Well, that, that was part of the problem, but that's, that's uh, been resolved uh, long before now. So this is found in North America. So uh, brontosaurus and apatosaurus are both in North America. Its length is 30 meters. That's how big? 90 feet. Height is 5 meters, that's 15 feet. And its mass is 15 tons. It was a herbivore, ate plants, and it's uh, in the lower Cretaceous, upper Jurassic. <clears throat> Here's another, another example just to whet your appetite this is Tyrannosaurus. Found in North America. It's uh, how big? 12 meters. That's uh, 36 feet. The largest one is a uh, Sioux. I think one of the largest ones is Sioux. And Sioux's femur is 53 inches long. The femur on our duck dinosaur is 54 inches long. And of course, that's in Texas. So that may explain that we have bigger duck-billed dinosaurs than, than we do T-Rex. Uh, walked on two legs. Uh, it weighed, I think, about six tons. I don't see a 7,000 kilograms. That's about uh, seven or eight tons. And how fast could it run? How fast? Could it outrun a human being? It depends on who you talk to. It can't turn fast. It's not probably not man maneuverable, but uh, it we don't know. The estimates range from 10 miles an hour to 45 miles an hour, so nobody really knows for sure. Yes. I don't know that that's an issue with Tyrannosaurus. With the duck-billed dinosaurs, the tail was completely interlaced with tendons all the way along, just like, the, uh, just like the cables in a bridge. So while its tail would, and those, are, those tendons are, are bone, they aren't, they aren't just uh, cartilage, they're bone. So the duck-billed dinosaur would not have been able to raise and lower its tail but it could go from side to side. 
So it could have had a swimming motion with its tail, or it could be for walking. Okay, here's the Ornithischian family tree. And again, we'll get into the details of this later on, just to show you uh, a beginning of the distribution. These are some strange reptiles of the uh, Mesozoic. Shavaropteryx is a lizard, not a dinosaur. It's a lizard, but look at how it flew through the trees. How do we know that? Because we find its impression in a rock. And you can actually see where these membranes were. Uh, Longa squamata, I have no idea what this guy's doing. At one time, people thought he was on his way to becoming a bird. But uh, that was silly, and it's no longer held by anybody. And here is, uh, here is pteranodon here, which is a flying reptile, pterodactyl. Oh, here, here you can see the out, outline of Shavaropteryx here. Then we have the marine reptiles. We have the archosaurs, nothosaurs, placodons, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs. Yes? Aren't archosaurs mainly terrestrial ichthyosaurs? Well, let's, crocodiles and alligators are archosaurs, so they, they at least are amphibious. They certainly can go on land, and they can run very well on land. And probably most of these other ones could not. And again, this is just to remind you that birds are showing up. And uh, even though these lines are flat down here, there are plenty of species present in the Cretaceous. And notice the bump up toward the end of the Cretaceous, uh, where the increase in birds, number of species of birds. Uh, birds are identified by a bipedal stance. They have certain pelvic structures that are distinctive. Uh, they also have some differences in their limbs, the way they're constructed. Mostly, modern birds are toothless, but there are some fossil birds that had teeth. Uh, evolutionists believe that feathers are modified scales, that all you have to do is just say poof and a scale becomes a feather. Mm -hmm. But if you've ever looked at a feather, at the structure of a feather, you'll realize uh, this had to be designed by a competent engineer, not by nothing. Remember, evolution cannot have a goal in mind. A scale cannot decide it wants to become a feather and then become a feather. So. Uh, this idea that uh, we can wish ourselves into something which, which was, is called Lamarckism, uh, that idea was thrown out by science a long time ago. It's coming back, but it's coming back with some, some wearing some clothes of science. And here you can see how we get to birds from dinosaurs, those who wish to make birds out of dinosaurs. Uh, this is an elimination diagram bird cladogram, it tells you what each, between each one of these groups, what's been added. And you can see all of these characteristics are ones that modern birds have. So you have to come from down here all the way up to here, and you have a modern bird. Whether all these guys were on their way to becoming birds or not is the question. And uh, here is Arch Archaeopteryx up here, and uh, then more modern birds up here at the top. But again, we'll have a lecture on that later. And here is Archaeopteryx, the famous icon of the Jurassic, which evolutionary biologists wish had been found in Upper Cretaceous, but it's not. It's in Jurassic. It is not a bird, and it is not a dinosaur. Uh, it is a dinosaur-like bird. It has a lot of characteristics of birds, but it has some characteristics of dinosaurs as well. It had flight feathers, so it clearly could fly. It has a tail, a long bony tail with feathers on it. Um, its uh, structures inside, I don't think it has a furcula, I've forgotten. And uh, it has a lot of characteristics 
of birds. Its hip is bird hip, not dinosaur. It does not have an open acetabulum, so it is not a dinosaur. And people that would say it was a dinosaur don't know their systematics. How do you get a dinosaur out of a bird that has a closed acetabulum? All right, and then we have the mammals. Mammals are characterized by having mammary glands. That means they produce milk. They have hair. They have a high metabolic rate, as do birds, by the way, and a high body temperature. So these are things that are unique and distinct, and you can't just jump from being cold-blooded to being warm-blooded. There are a lot of things that have to change in your body between cold-blooded and warm-blooded. And um, so you have distinctive differences between mammals and birds and the other forms of life. The mammals typically have large brains, but I defy you to find a mammal that's smarter than a raven that can do the things that a raven can do. You can maybe do it, but you're going to have to work hard to find a, a mammal that can, on its own, think of making tools and then using those tools to get at food and, and doing various things like that. Three ear bones. All, all the mammals have all their ear bones intact. They have complex teeth. That means that we have baby teeth and we have adult teeth and they replace each other. Fewer bones in the lower jaw because, according to evolution, those bones have migrated into the inner ear and become the ear bones. And then a secondary palate. This is a evolution, putative evolutionary diagram of how mammals came to be uh, from the non-mammalian mammal-like reptiles, the therapsids, and then eventually out come the mammals. Well, this is Triassic, and we already have mammals by Middle Triassic, so about this point right here, we already have genuine mammals. And the non-mammal, mammal-like reptiles and other reptiles have disappeared. These are the characteristics of mammals. Here are the bones of the skull, that, uh, bones of the jaw that are going to become the bones of the inner ear. And here are the mammals that uh, we are finding here as teeth. This is uh, Morganucodon, which is a um, which is a marsupial. Hadracodium, Megazostrodon. These are all. Look, here's the head. Does it give you an idea of the size? So these are very small. As a rule, these are very small animals, about the size of a shrew. Any of you ever seen a shrew? It's about this big. And yet last year in, in Gar Quarry, one of, our, one of our students found this. And that is the jaw of a didelphodon. And it's this big, the jaw. The skull would be this big, and we're talking about a very large animal. Uh, so this is probably one of the largest animals that's been found in the Mesozoic. And so those of you working in the quarries, you have the potential to change our understanding of the history of life on the Earth.